Hi, I'm Mr. McMillan and welcome to Edexcel GCSE RS Unit 10.2 Part 4. In this video we'll look at the Catholic understanding of apostolic tradition and how this relates to the Bible, Protestant views on authority, as well as beliefs about Mary. In the previous video we looked at the idea of apostolic succession, which means that the current Pope and bishops have the same authority and responsibility as Peter and the Apostles did. This is based on the belief that Jesus appointed Peter and the Apostles to protect, to preserve and to pass on his teachings. The first generation of church leaders were in the privileged position of having direct access to the teachings of Jesus. By being directly with Jesus they received what is sometimes called the deposit of faith, which refers to all of the original teachings of Jesus as given to the Apostles, not just those that would be written down. Starting at Pentecost, the Apostles, led by Peter, began to fulfil Jesus' command to spread the Gospel and share this deposit of faith with new converts. Jesus himself never wrote anything down, at least to the best of our knowledge, but over time much of what the Apostles preached about Jesus was written down, either by them personally or their close associates. Some of this was in the form of memoirs of the life of Jesus, what became known as the Gospels. Some was the history of the early church, while much of it was in the form of letters written by the Apostles to different individuals and groups. The early church began the process of copying and collecting together these writings. By the 4th century the church had a clear distinct group of writings which they called the New Testament. Along with the Jewish scriptures, known as the Torah, which would become known as the Old Testament, these two collections form what Christians now know as the Bible. The word Bible simply meaning a collection of writings or library. So why does the Bible have authority for Catholics? The Catechism says that the Bible is the words of God expressed in the words of men. The Bible itself presents a claim to be from God. St Paul wrote to Timothy saying, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults and giving instruction for right living. In other words, Christians believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible and the Holy Spirit guided the early church in the process of selecting which writings were inspired and to be included in the biblical canon. Let's move forward to the current day. When a Christian today hears or reads the Bible, this is like sitting with the apostles, listening to them recount their time with Jesus. The New Testament is effectively their recollection, reflection and redaction of the teachings of Jesus. Peter and the apostles were the first magisterium and what they wrote had authority because of apostolic succession. However, what they wrote down, and what became the Bible, was not exhaustive nor systematic. It was not written as a textbook designed to cover everything, but as the particular concerns of a growing movement spreading out throughout the world. As the church grew, it was inevitable that disagreements would occur. When issues or disputes arose, it was the responsibility of Peter and the apostles, who were the first magisterium, to deal with the issues. This often meant reflecting on what Jesus had taught, and then clarifying what Christians should believe or practice. The first example of this process of church decision making can be found in the New Testament in the book of Acts. As the church grew with non-Jewish converts, the issue of circumcision led to a dispute. On one side, some of the Jewish Christians believed that Gentile converts must be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. Others believed circumcision had been replaced by baptism and so was not necessary for Gentile converts. The church met together in Jerusalem in what was the first example of a church council, now called the Council of Jerusalem. In this case, the church council decided that circumcision wasn't necessary for new converts. After Peter and the first generation of church leaders had died, their successors continued to use this process of church councils to resolve disputes as and when they came about. A well-known example of this was the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century. A priest called Arius had been teaching that Jesus' divinity was not equal to the Father. At the Council of Nicaea, a creed was published which clarified that to be a Christian you had to believe that Jesus was consubstantial with the Father. In Greek this was the word homoousios, which means to be of the same substance. This process of church councils producing formal statements of belief has continued through the history of the church. The most recent example was the Second Vatican Council, which took place in the 1960s. At this council, one of the issues that the church reflected on was the development of various forms of artificial contraception, and whether or not they should be considered moral for Christians to use. This was something Jesus had not directly addressed, and so it was the role of the magisterium to interpret the teachings of the church on this issue. Their decision was that taking into account the church's view on marriage, sex and the sanctity of life, that forms of artificial contraception could not be condoned. 
These teachings are now formalised into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Collectively, this process of using councils, creeds and the Catechism to clarify, structure and preserve the true Christian faith is what Catholics refer to as apostolic tradition. Because of apostolic succession, the magisterium has the authority to protect, to preserve and to pass on the Christian faith. The various clarifications, interpretations and additions that have been added by the church over the centuries form what we call the apostolic tradition. So let's summarise the Catholic understanding of authority and then see how it compares with the Protestant view. For Catholics, the final authority lies with the church, which was passed on from Jesus to the apostles, as seen in Matthew 16. Because of apostolic succession, this authority is passed to the Pope and the Magisterium today. Over the centuries, the teachings of the Apostles and their successors have been collected together to form what is called the Apostolic Tradition. The Bible, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is a major part of the Apostolic Tradition, along with the creeds, the councils and the catechism. The authoritative interpretation of the Bible is the responsibility of the Church, through the Magisterium. Individual Catholics should read the Bible for themselves, but within the framework of the Apostolic Tradition. For Catholics, the Holy Spirit works by guiding the leaders of the Church to come to the authoritative interpretation of the Apostolic Tradition. Protestant Christians take a different approach. The German reformer Martin Luther in the 16th century developed the principle of sola scriptura, which is Latin for by scripture alone. This view claims that there is no authority other than the Bible. There is no official interpreter and each person is ultimately their own pope, the final authority. An individual can and should read the Bible for themselves. The role of the Holy Spirit is to guide the individual to come to a full understanding of the true meaning of Scripture. We now move on to look at the importance of the Virgin Mary for Catholics. At the same time, I'll use this as an opportunity to highlight the distinctly different approaches to authority taken by Catholics and Protestants. The Bible says comparatively little about the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because of this, Protestants, who rely on the Bible alone, make very few claims about Mary and her particular role within salvation history or Christian beliefs. At the Annunciation, the angel says to Mary, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But Protestants would not attach anything more significant to this verse than what is read at face value. On the other hand, when reading the same verse, Catholics appeal to the apostolic tradition, which they claim shows that from the very beginning of the church, it was understood that Mary had a unique role in salvation. For example, by the 3rd century, many writings about Mary refer to her as the Theotokos, which is Greek for Mother of God. In 1854, Pope Pius spoke ex cathedra on the issue of the Immaculate Conception. The Catholic view says that this was not a new teaching, but simply a clarification of what the Christian Church had always believed, claiming that this is what is hinted at in Luke 1.28 when the angel says Mary is highly favoured. Protestants, on the other hand, reject this belief, as they say since it cannot be found explicitly in the Bible, it is not true. As I've just mentioned, Catholics believe in the Immaculate Conception. This is the belief that Mary herself was conceived without sin and continued to live a life without sin. The Catechism says, Through the centuries the Church has become ever more aware that Mary, full of grace, through God, was redeemed from the moment of her conception. This quote from the Catechism shows how Catholics use the Bible supported by apostolic tradition to clarify what the church teaches. Catholics also believe in the virgin birth. This is the belief that Jesus was conceived without sin and that Mary fell pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit rather than through sexual intercourse. Mary is also called ever virgin because the church teaches that she remained a virgin for all of her life. Catholics are called to show devotion or respect to Mary. This is called veneration, which means to highly honor a person or object. Catholics would clearly state that veneration is not the same as worship. Only God is worthy of worship. However, veneration means to show honour to God's creation or creatures, which itself brings glory to God also. How do Catholics venerate Mary? Because of the belief in the communion of saints, Catholics may ask for her intercession, with the Hail Mary being the most common example of this. The rosary, which involves repeating the Hail Mary prayer, is also a popular form of showing devotion to Mary. Many Catholic churches will have a statue of Mary, or perhaps a side chapel, which is sometimes called a lady chapel in honour of Mary. The church liturgical calendar honours Mary by marking various events in her life, such as the Annunciation, or her Assumption into Heaven. Some well-known sites of Marian pilgrimage include Lourdes in France, Knock in Ireland, and Walsingham in England. Thanks for watching, I've been Mr McMillan. That's the end of part 4. Please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Give this video a thumbs up and follow me on Twitter at MrMcMillanRevise.
And remember, as always, you can also download an audio version of this video from iTunes. 